Should I start now? You're running it. Okay. We're starting. All right. Let me. Um, I'm going to redo the renormalization group for continuum quantum field theory in terms that are, I think, much clearer and simpler. Um, so, once again, we're going to take this field theory that um,
and uh, took the limit in which all of the um, absolute, well, S is positive. S is much greater than um, M squared, and absolute value of T is much greater than M squared, and absolute value of U is much greater than M squared. So in this case, the amplitude takes this form. Um, there's a minus sign here, that's why there's an i pi. So, are we ignoring constants, like in front of the g? There's an i. Okay. Um, for some reason, so Weinberg two? throws away the i. Uh, um, are these terms, do these only have to do with the vertex, the vertices? Well, there's a loop here. Right. But I mean, the first one is just the g. I mean, that comes yeah, from the yeah, vertex, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so presumably this is two copies of the Well, you know, I mean, when you actually do the thing, you get a delta fourth. Or yeah, exactly. Momenta, you get That's a factors of pi. Is that those things are missing. But uh, I think all the pi's cancel, and it's just a, a effectively, it depends on how you normalize the thing. OK, but let's just go with this. Um, OK, so. What we do is we simply define G mu as the amplitude at uh, some scale where um, this at S equals mu equals minus P equals minus U. So do you have to include this? Uh the non-loop diagram in order for this uh, to hold, make on, sense. hold on, hold on, this is a square. What? So this A has the diagram with no loops. Plus the diagram with one so loop. It's, it's the physical amplitude. Right, right, but it includes the one with, with no loops. So you have do you have to include that one in order to get this? Yes, this, yes, yes. This run. The one with no loops is this one. Right. So that would just be G in that case. Yes. And and so now what we're doing, I actually I made a mistake here. This is supposed to be the real part of the amplitude. Because I want I don't want to imagine I want I don't want a complex couple parts. But you could define like a delta G, right? That was that G mu minus the original G. And so that would only be the contribution from the loop diagram. I mean, is that something people do? For what purpose? I mean just so I don't have to talk about the the case with no loops? Well, no, I mean, the case with no loops is the, is the main thing. This is a, the one loop is a, is, a, is right. It's the a in the context of perturbation theory, the one loop is a small correction. Right, that's why I would rather talk about like a delta G than a, than a G. Yes. Well, all right, let, let me just say what, what, what we've got here. This is real part of A at this thing, and what is that? Well, that is. G minus 3 G squared over 32 pi squared log lambda squared over mu squared plus 1. So I dropped off. I've gotten rid of pi. Actually, I owe you a candy. Sorry to throw it so fast. No, it's good. Helps me practice. Okay. Now, this allows us to write the bare coupling as the renormalized coupling plus 3g squared over 32 pi squared times log of lambda squared over mu squared plus one. Okay. Let me fit you in because uh, you were apparently delayed due to various crimes in the street. Um, we're considering <laughs> The scale, a scalar field theory, and um, the if you do the amplitude to one loop order, this is what you get for in a certain limit, and this is a high energy limit, energy much greater than m squared, and um, there's a minus sign here which gives you an i. Now, I'm going to define the renormalized coupling constant, the running coupling at scale mu, to be 
the, re the real part, somebody saying something? Wouldn't the loop die, like in a high energy limit, wouldn't the loop, loops be more likely? The same wouldn't be more likely. Or a particle to you? No, no, no. The loop, no, the loop term goes down in high energies here. Mm -hmm. It does. Because of I, the S there. I see, I see the formula, but I'm, I'm wondering intuitively why. Well, well, this is only I, good. I mean, I, I, I don't have such fine intuition. This is only good for high energy anyway, right? This simplification is only good. I mean, if you want, I can run to my office and grab Weinberg's real formula. But I, um, I'm trying to present something that has, uh, is where I've cleaned away the mathematical foliage that makes it confusing. Um, okay, so here uh, we replay, uh, this tells us the bare coupling is the running coupling plus these terms. And then what we can do is we can express over here the, um, what you make it straight? Re-express the amplitude. The amplitude then is g mu minus g squared over 32 pi squared. And what happens is that if we substitute in here, in other words, we we replace g by g mu plus this. In fact, let me do this explicitly then. So the amplitude is G. And G is G mu plus three o plus three G squared over thirty-two pi squared log lambda squared over mu squared plus one. And that's the first term. And then we have minus G squared over thirty-two pi squared. minus g squared over 32 pi squared log lambda to the 6 over stu plus i pi plus 3. Okay. Now, you see what happens is uh, the, the lambda to the 6 g squared, 32 pi squared, and minus sign cancels the log lambda squared, 3 g squared over 32 pi squared. So this thing is actually equal to g mu minus g squared over 32 pi squared log mu to the 6 over stu plus i pi. Um, And the one apparently cancels also. I didn't expect the one to cancel, but it apparently does cancel. Okay. Um, now, what we do is we. So, so, so. Let me first of all point out that by doing this, we've gotten rid of the uh, cutoff. This was a computation with a cutoff. Uh, previously, when we did renormalization, we were using dimensional regularization, but uh, a simpler form is just to cut off the ultraviolet integrals in some huge value. Um, a somewhat more sophisticated way was introduced by Pauli and Villars. And uh, the pauli villars thing is, if you have a propagator of 1 over k squared, Got so many metrics minus m squared plus i epsilon, and I'm, I'm, I'm you're to understand minus or plus and plus or minus. 
you subtract a 1 over k squared minus lambda squared plus ix1. So you change propagators like this. This is actually a, a rather nice scheme. So for ordinary momenta with lambda huge, this term is negligible. But as k's get up in the range of lambda squared, then um, the, uh, the two terms uh, cancel. In other words, um, actually, I'm not, I, when I last looked at this, they were canceling beautifully. Oh, yeah, it's just one over k squared minus one over k squared. What am I saying? It's obvious. Okay? If, I, if it wasn't obvious to me, maybe it isn't obvious to you if you haven't seen it before. So the point is, when k is small, this term is irrelevant and we haven't done anything. When k is huge, you can ignore the lambda squared, ignore the m squared, and 1 over k squared cancels 1 over k squared. So that's Pauli Villar's regularization. And it was the main way of... Is lambda an energy scale here? Or yes. Right? Okay. Is that a cutoff? Energy, yes. And, but, but this is an elegant cutoff because it's smooth. Right. And if you do the computation with that cutoff, this is what you wind up with, again, in the limit of m of, of all the Mandelstam. The absolute value of all the Mandelstam variables is huge compared to little m. Um, now, the idea, though, is uh, that in this expression, we, we're holding lambda finite. The coupling constants are sufficiently small that for lambda finite, we can interchange g and g mu. And so finally, we have that the amplitude is actually g mu minus g mu squared over 32 pi squared log mu to the 6 over stu plus i So what justifies that? Well, that's the whole philosophy of perturbation theory. Um, in other words, the idea is that something's going on at uh, in other words, particles really aren't point particles. They are extended. So everything is actually, so you never really integrate over the very high momenta. And so, and, and so you can do the calculation with a finite cutoff. It's just bigger than the energy scales we're used to, but it's a hell of a lot smaller than infinity. And then the next thing is that with that cutoff in place, you can somehow do perturbation theory and get effectively an asymptotic series. It's not even a convergent series for the answer. Um, and uh, something else I was going to say that somehow slipped my mind because I was thinking of something else. All right, in any event, this is our expression for the amplitude. Okay, the next thing we do is we say, well, uh, we want the amplitude to be independent of the scale of renormalization mu. Okay. And it obviously depends upon it through the mu here and the mu there and the mu there. So we want all this dependence to cancel. So that means we say dA d mu is well, it's first of all dg, dg mu, d mu, and then it's minus 2 uh, g mu over 32 pi squared on <coughs> this whole bracket here, lambda, natural log mu to the sixth over stu uh, plus i pi. And then, of course, this important term. I'm thinking of you, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yi Mu. Yi Mu. Okay, who said that? Okay, um, that's that term, but then there's the, the, the really critical term here, which is, um, let's bring out the, uh, bring out the, uh, the six, and um, um, if we bring out the six, then it's just the uh, six log mu, and so it's one over mu. So this is, um, minus 6 g mu squared over 32 pi squared um, 1 over mu. Okay. So all, t and this has to be 0. So this is, in, in other words, effectively another Callan's emancipation. So this tells us then that the g nu d nu times 1 minus g nu over 16 pi squared log mu to the sixth over square plus i is equal to 6 over 32 g mu squared over pi squared mu. Okay. And consequently, g mu d mu is um, uh, 3 over 16 pi squared, uh, or let us say, well, now let's, what should I do? Let's just do it this way. Then. Let's just do it in a straightforward way. 3 over 16 pi squared, g mu squared over mu, and then we have to divide by this huge 1 minus g mu over 16 pi squared log mu to the sixth over 2 plus i pi. And so to lowest order, this is a higher order term, to lowest order this is just 3 over 16 pi squared g mu squared over mu. And that tells us that mu dg mu d mu is 3 over 16 pi squared uh, g mu squared. Okay. And this is beta of G mu. Okay. Right. So this is the this is then the renormalization group equation. Now what I like about this way of doing it, apart from the simplicity, is that we once again have this very physical requirement that we when we re -ex when we express the physical amplitude in terms of a running coupling constant in a consistent way, with all the cutoffs gone. Uh, then we require that the physical amplitude be independent of the scale of renormalization, and then that gives us this very nice um, uh, equation. And of course, one of the nice things about the equation is that one can actually integrate it. In other words, we can integrate from m to e. Uh, in other words, let's rewrite the equation a little bit. This is dg over beta is equal to d mu over mu. I think I should have rewritten that that way. And if we integrate that, then we have integral d mu over mu from, e, from m to e is log e over m. And once again, I've got this damn confusion with mu and capital M, so this is E over M. And this then has to be the integral from G sub M to G sub E 
see G mu over beta of G mu. And this is then the integral from Gm to G D, D G mu. And now beta of uh, G mu is 3 G mu squared with a 16 pi squared up there. And so altogether, this is 16 pi squared over 3 integrals dg over g squared from gm to gd. And this is then 16 pi squared over 3, 1 over gm minus 1 over gd. And the order is reversed because it's a minus sign. Okay, so that's our expression. So where do the bounds on the d mu integration come from? What, what are capital M and capital E? Energies. Right. M is, is just some reference energy. And E is what we're doing. And E is going to be... Um, where we're doing In other words, we want to find out... We, we've derived a differential equation for how the, re, the running coupling constant varies with the renormalization point. We now want to turn that into an actual formula for the running coupling constant at energy E right. in terms of the running coupling constant at some fixed mass M. Okay. All right. And well, this is the uh, this is what we've got. We've got 16 pi squared over three. This is the thing that I gagged on last time because. Um, I just hadn't, hadn't prepared the rest of the lecture yesterday. <laughs> I thought I had tons to talk about, and apparently I talked too fast. So this is 1 over gm minus 1 over ge is log e over m. OK, so this is 1 over gm minus 1 over g sub e is 3 over 16 pi squared log e over m. And now um, we can say that's 1 over g e is 1 over g m minus 3 over 16 pi squared log e over m. So now we're almost there. We just invert both sides. And we get GE is 1 over 1 over GM minus 3 over 16 pi squared log E over M. And now we multiply both sides, uh, top and bottom by GM. And we get G sub M over 1 minus 3 G sub M over 16 pi squared log over M. Okay. All right. So this tells us then how the uh, coupling constant runs. The coupling constant energy scale E is the coupling constant at some lower energy scale divided by 1 minus 3G at that lower scale of the 16 pi squared and the log of the ratio. So for energies near M, GE, of course, is GM, as it must be. But as E increases over M and creeps up, this thing becomes uh, GM over 1 minus some positive number. And so it increases. And so drawing this thing, what would it look like? It would be that it, uh, M the coupling here is here is uh, g sub n, and then it slowly increases um, out to say e, and well, I I don't really know how it slowly increases, but let me just say that it just slowly increases. It's I say slowly because it's a log. 
Um, let's notice one other thing about this that's uh, really relevant. Let's turn around to over to here. Look at this formula. The amplitude is G mu minus all of this, okay? All right. Suppose we now are dealing with um, a, uh, a scattering problem where STU is of the order of mu to the sixth. In that case, this term is uh, just a log of one, so that's zero. You just have an i pi, and then a is essentially g mu. So g, this running coupling constant gives you the um, amplitude. Um, in other words, the the, the, the no loop diagram is is a very good approximation to the total amplitude when uh, STU is mu to the six, in other words, at the renormalization time. So in other words, effectively, the, another way of talking about the running coupling constant is it allows you to do, it allows you to get the scattering amplitude more or less to one loop without, um, without including the one loop term. You essentially get it for free in the zero loop expression. So how do we know what the coupling constant is at the lower energy scale, at the fixed one? Well, I mean, if you're dealing with a real theory, anything like that comes from experiment. Okay. Okay, now, what else? All right, let me now say how this thing goes in, uh, in electrodynamics. And unfortunately, I don't, I don't have this structured in my mind in a simple, in a simple framework as that. So I'm going to do something that's a little bit more formal. Um, basically, the renormalized problem is um, square root of Z3 times the Baer coupling. And also, the renormalized coupling over the running coupling. In this case, it's defined in the following way. 1 over pi squared of mu. I mean, sorry. E renormalized over E mu is, is square root of 1 minus pi squared of mu, where this pi, pi squared, pi is the thing we computed back in, uh, we, used, we computed this with dimensional regularization weeks ago, in fact, months ago. And um, so that means that this is approximately 1 minus er squared over 4 pi squared, integral 0 to 1 dx, x 1 minus x, log 1 minus mu squared x 1 minus x over mu squared. So the, the running so, coupling is different from the renormalized coupling? Right. Right, the renormalized coupling doesn't doesn't run. Okay. The renormalized coupling is the is is the one such that. What's the analog in terms of the, the e r e r squared yeah. over four pi is one over one hundred thirty seven point whatever it is. Right, but we never had some ratio like this over for the scalar field. Are there analogs for yeah, ER? Yeah, wait, wait, wait. I'm I'm doing this differently. Okay, the. Okay. This is a somewhat different um, derivation of how E mu should be defined. It's so it's a, it's a. I tried to rewrite it in such a way that it would mirror this discussion, but somehow I, I keep.
kept getting assigned more than so I just gave up and went to this. Um, okay, by the way, this pi, this pi um, squared here, or I should say pi, it comes from this one loop diagram which we worked out before. Okay. And we did it before at zero, right? At um, zero. If, if we were using this to get ER squared, we were doing Q, Q squared equal to zero. Mm, okay. I see. Now what we're saying is that, um, that ER over E mu is effective, involves this pi at uh, Q squared equal to mu squared. This used to be Q squared, where Q is this form. And um, frankly, uh, what, we're to what we might be talking about here is this sort of a, in other words, a scattering process. And in that case, um, Q squared uh, would be um, negative. And so, well, or is that minus Q squared? Oh, so And um, right, so Q squared is positive in Weinberg metric. Yeah. Okay. In other words, um, the, the end. Of this could be all three momentum in elastic scattering. In other words, we tend to be that. In the center of mass frame, uh, no, so no the, time the time energies time. would be the same. So you just have three momentum. Q squared then is positive, and we set it equal to U squared. So I, I and much greater than M E squared. So that's the that, that's the limit that we're going to. If we go to that limit and rewrite things, then what we get is um, E mu. Is then um, E R over this structure one minus E R squared over four pi squared, etc., and that gives us approximately E R plus E R cubed over twelve pi squared, and this is log mu over m e minus 5 over 6. So this is an approximation in a limit of huge Q, of mu squared being, mu, Q squared being mu squared, mu squared being much greater than me squared. But... So where did the integration go? The integration over x? Yeah. It gives us um, a 3 and a minus 5, 6. This, this, this is actually much simpler than you think. And um, in fact, nah, I, I used Maple and um, Math World to try to do the integration. Both failed. But I was having dinner with Franco, and he could do it in his head. Because in fact, he pointed out that when you integrate log of x1 minus x, you first turn this thing as integral dx log x plus log 1 minus x, then these are elementary integrations. For some reason, Maple can't do that. And math world couldn't do it either. But of course, they don't allow you to have hours on their machine. They just well, you really have, you have another factor of a function of x in front of those, but. All right, yeah, but it's not, it's still not yeah. very hard. In any event, you do the integral, this is what we get. Okay, so now what we have is um, E mu is equal to that, and so we say mu, the E mu, the mu, well, what is it? We forget about this and that, and we just get a 1 over mu, which cancels, so it's just 
E R squared, E R cubed, sorry, over uh, 12 R squared. And um, what we do here effectively is we're saying this is effectively E mu cubed over 12 pi squared. So that's, um, that's the equation in this case. And um, so, so in other words, it's, it's actually very similar to this equation over here, um, except for the, except that we have a, a cube here. So the thing is, um, the mu of mu is um, de over e cubed 12 pi squared. Well, that's for all, right? So, no, I've got it wrong. It's 12. So this is a log e over m is 12 pi squared, uh, the integral just de over e cubed, and so that is 12 pi squared. Um, we have uh, minus, right, minus 2 over 2, minus 2 e to the minus 3 and e, and so log e over m is 12 pi squared, um, or let's just say 6 because of the 2, and we have um, 1 over e sub m squared minus 1 over e. In any event, the key, the, the key point is that the de mu de mu is positive. So it's increasing. And so, again, it's not an asymptotically free theory. And um, so, unfortunately, I didn't write down what the rest of this is, but. Um, Uh, what we can see is it's 1 over 6 pi squared log e over m is um, 1 over e m squared minus 1 over e e squared. And so this is 1 over e e squared is equal to 1 over e m squared minus 1 over 6 pi squared log e over m. And so then e sub e squared is 1 over 1, 1 over 1 over e m squared minus 1 over 6 pi squared log e over m, and so all together e squared e is e uh, squared m over 1 minus e squared m over 6 pi squared log e over m. All right, so it basically goes like that, and once again you get the same behavior. Now, um, this is only including the electron. In other words, we have here this photon and we have an electron loop. Only including the electron loop and going through this, we would find that e, e squared e over 4 pi, which is alpha, would be 1 over 134.6 at 
E equals 91 GV. But there are other particles that can be in the loop that are relevant. Muons, uh, if you're up to 91 GV, taus, uh, then there are other charged particles perhaps that can go in that loop. And all together what you find is that E squared over 4 pi uh, at mu equal to 91 GeV is 1 over 128.87 plus or minus 0.12. Uh, okay. So in other words, 1 over 129 instead of 1 over 137. So that's the increase of the fine structure constant. All right, let, let's see. Do I owe a candy to anybody? Get this approximation, just like in the last one. I did. <laughs> you mean when, when you replaced? You, you said the renormalized coupling isn't running. Right. And so this derivative to me looks like it's equal to a constant, and now we're replacing. Yeah, well, yeah, no, 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 no. You're, 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 that, that's completely with a completely legitimate objection. But um, like, is this assuming something about what scale we're at? That replacement. This replacement? Yeah. No, it's just the uh, It's basically the idea that when you're at order E cubed, um, you're only working to, in other words, the difference between E mu and, all right, let's look at this formula. The difference between the, 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 the running coupling constant of one energy and that at any other energy, one of which could be zero, for example. Well, not zero, because, you know, give me a break, right? <laughs> so the difference between the two, if you expand, is of order e to the fourth. That's it. So in other words, to order e cubed, there's no, the, the, you can write er as e mu to order e cubed. That's yes. the I mean, idea. we got this equation by making that replacement. So yes, I yes, yes. Oh, well, <laughs> okay. you're right about that. Yeah. I don't know if that's a good justification. But. Well, <laughs> or let, look, look at this equation. E mu is ER apart from a correction of order ER cubed. Okay. Okay, there. That's, that's your, the real answer. Yeah. Good, good thing you pushed that. You actually got me to figure it out. Um, I, I mean, I'll tell you, I'm, I've always been, been bothered by things like that. Um, yeah, this seems all really circular somehow. No, but it's not. It's yeah, actually it's not. not. It's actually it's not. Right. But what's, what bothers me more is what I did in the first derivation, the one that was more straightforward and easier to understand, re, uh, identifying g squared with g mu squared because g is bare and g mu is running at scale mu. And uh, so I just had one question. So where did you get that numbers from, the e mu squared that was calculated using what expression? Something more where complicated. Where we had 128. Something more complicated than includes. Yeah. No, uh, Weinberg reported that. And this is including, this is including e plus e minus plus mu plus mu minus plus tau, tau minus, and so forth. And the reason for 91 Jeb is that that was the energy it left. It was 45 on 40, well, 45 and a half on 45 and a half. And that was a very good machine, which they unfortunately destroyed in order to make the LHC, because the Congress destroyed the SSC, which was a much better machine. And which, of course, uh, the total cost of the SSC would have been less than one year of manned spaceflight, which so far has produced zero science. What about Velcro? One? Did they make Vel invent Velcro so they could use it in space? Oh, Pretty important. The comedians invented Velcro. 
<laughs> I don't know about that. They patented it too, <laughs> and it's a company. I mean, the guy once <clears throat> bought money, bought stock. My uncle did. One of them. All right, I'm going to talk about something else, which um, is more related to condensed matter, and it's more the Wilsonian point of view for renormalization. And uh, to make the arithmetic simple, uh, well, we can take two viewpoints. Well, let's just say that we're doing these things in Euclidean steps. So everything's good. Four-dimensional Euclidean space. Right. Or if we're doing condensed matter physics, we're in three-dimensional Euclidean space. better. All right. OK. So z of lambda, then, is an integral sub lambda d phi e to the minus integral d d x l of phi. And in fact, we're, when I say we're doing this in Euclidean space, yes, but it's Euclidean space of d dimensions. I'm not thinking in terms of dimensional regularization. I'm just saying we might be doing this in three dimensions for solid state physics. <coughs> We might be doing this in four dimensions, which, which again could be finite temperature physics, uh, or it could be continuum QCD or anything in really in four dimensions. Um, or we could be just for fun doing something in some crazy dimension. But, uh, I'm, oh, but I'm thinking of D being an integer here, not some complex one. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, Here's the basic idea. This means we only integrate, if we're, we're writing, um, say, phi of x as an integral d d k over 2 pi to the d e to the i k x phi of k. And we're, what we're saying here is that phi of k is 0 for k, uh, k squared, let us say, uh, greater than lambda squared. So that's what this sub lambda means. In other words, we're only integrating over momentum less than some lambda. And because if we're doing dense matter physics, there's an obvious cutoff, namely the lattice spacing, mm -hmm. spacing of the physical lattice. In fact, it would be wouldn't even be that small. Okay. Now, there are two, 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 two things involved here. Um, suppose we consider, we consider this, but we also consider the same thing, but um, at lambda minus delta lambda, which we're going to write as b times lambda. Whoops, lambda I. And so B is some number less than one. And so then we can write Z of lambda is then going to be an integral of sub lambda minus delta lambda. Oh, wait. Let me first of all say what we're doing here. We're going to write phi now as a log of phi of k, or phi, actually phi of x as well. Anyway, we're going to say phi s is phi, I'm sorry, phi is phi s plus phi uh, Wrigley or Wrigley. Phi Wrigley means that um, the k's here. <coughs> k squared is less than lambda squared, but greater than b squared lambda squared. And phi slow is um, k squared less than b squared lambda squared. So we're going to be writing this thing as, first of all, an integral, half integral over phi slow, e to the minus integral c d x lambda, uh, Lagrange density of phi slow, but then we also have to integrate over, actually it should have been fast rather than really, right? but anyway, I'm really that. Um, e to the minus, 
minus integral dd sum L1 of now we have phi slow and phi relay. So we're just writing this thing in two ways. All right, now. Um, this thing here, we're going to call e to the minus integral dd of delta L of phi slope. In other words, this integral over phi wiggly of L1 of phi slow and phi fast, fast as well, phi uh, slow and phi fast, this is something that depends upon phi s. And we're going to call it e to the minus integral of delta lambda of phi slow. And so all together then, we've got that this is an integral lambda minus delta lambda d phi slow e to the minus integral d dx l of phi slow plus delta l of phi slow. OK. So that is that. Now, so, uh, I, I did not understand what, yeah. what exactly did we do? I mean, why did the uh, Lagrangian yeah. split in that specific? I mean, what was the? No, here we the L and L one. Did Did you ask a question before? I mean, do I need all your work handy? I'll take it later. <laughs> all right. So, what's your question? So I, I didn't quite hear it. How did we, you know, go from? The Lagrangian being a function of p to how do you go from that to that? No, from the one before the original Lagrangian to splitting it into L and L1, where L1 is a function of ps and p. Ah, oh, brilliant question. Um, I'm about to get to that. Um, what you do is you write phi as phi slow plus phi fast. And then you substitute that in here, okay. and you expand. And exactly. how what happens depends upon what L is. Yes. Okay. So now I'm now I'm looking for a place to continue to write. Um, I found out, by the way, one reason why the boards are so terrible is that on Sunday someone uh, holds a tutoring session in here, uses the this chalk that is so white and covered and, and well he basically whacked out this board and that board. Well he nice enough to erase what he left, but what he what he left was of course this cloud, white cloud. Two white clouds. And then of course we had all the lectures today. I suppose I'm gonna go down there because there's less writing there. All right, so let's 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 try to answer your question. Maybe let's figure out why. Um, let's figure out what so much for the chalk. Let's figure out what. Okay, so what is this thing then? P D X L1 of phi slow phi W. Phi, I don't even call, I'm gonna call it phi fast. Well, first of all, let's say what L is. L is gonna be a half d phi, d phi squared. D phi squared means it's just um, we're in Euclidean space, and so it's just it's just it's just the thing up there, but no minus sign. No minus sign because it's um, uh, a is Euclidean space and uh, b um, who's this is metric. I'm following here Z's book. Z's metric is the opposite of Weinberg's. 
but the same as Peskin, since they're only two. Well, in Euclid Euclidean space, how are the metrics different at all? Well, well, the point is, what you do is you take the Weinberg oh, thing. Whatever the original one was. You take the space part of the Weinberg thing, that governs the sign. So that's the plus. And what we're going to do is we're just going to consider this thing as lambda n phi to the n. Okay, and we can imagine a sum of these things. For example, the mass term is n equals 2. If we're talking about 5 4 theory, there's an n equals 4 term. There might be higher terms or lower terms. And um, okay, so let's let's do this explicitly. Actually, what we have then is lambda of phi slope. I'm going to write it as phi fast. So f and w are the same. <laughs> okay, so what will this be? This will be a half d mu phi slope plus d mu phi fast squared plus a sum of terms lambda to the n phi slope plus phi fast uh, to the n. Okay. Now here's the cool thing. Phi slow and phi fast differ by having different Fourier components. Phi fast only has the fast ones. Phi slow has many more components, but they're all slower than the fast ones. The integral d d x phi slow times phi fast is zero because they're orthogonal Fourier components. EVI. In other words, the only way in which this thing can be the same, can be non-zero, is if the momenta are equal and opposite. Or, and that can't happen because one is faster than the other. The same thing is true for derivatives. So dm, dn of that is zero. Okay. So this thing is effectively a half d mu phi slow squared plus a half d mu phi fast squared plus these other terms, sum on n, lambda n, and once again, in any of these terms, it's just going to be phi slow to the n plus phi fast to the n. Because the cross terms, I'll assume the cross terms all cancel on the night. Um, it might be that if you had several slows, they might make up to be one fast. So. Um, Let me, um, all right, let's, let's leave that ambiguous. In any event, the, all these terms, together with most of the other terms, all the terms, the phi slow terms basically come together like this. And um, in, in the end, you're going to integrate it anyway, right? So you can just use that argument. But that only has them raised to the first power. That's OK. There. They'll be orthogonal, right? Um, um, I don't know. So you could exponentiate some. Well, all of right. I mean, the, the question like is, that. yeah. What, right, the question is, what about phi Something s? Higher frequency. Well, let's put it this way: phi s phi fast to the n, where n is greater than or equal to one. These are all going to integrate to zero. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Um, what about terms? that have, it might be possible to have a phi slow squared and a phi fast. This might work, okay? But, all right, let, let, let's leave this aside. In any event, these guys are going to all combine to make just, in other words, we're going to recreate, this is going to recreate lambda of phi, uh, L of phi slow, plus 
other complicated terms involved. Well, there's going to be one term that's going to be L phi fast. And then there are going to be all sorts of other terms. Um, yeah, there may be some. I mean, it seems like you're already. There may or may not be some cross terms. Seems like you took it into account because you said it was a function of slow and fast. And the only way that's going to happen is if you have cross terms, right? I mean, otherwise you can just factor it into slow. Yeah, all right. So let's say that there are some cross terms and that makes the thing somewhat complicated. Okay. And, um, all right, now here's a, here's a key observation. And I think this must have been one of, one of Wilson's insights because he really emphasizes symmetry. Oh boy, we're almost out of time. All right, let, let, let's, let's see. The point is that that, that when, let's define this thing over here. We already did define it. What we said was that this, so I, I compute what L1 is, and um, I think the honest answer is that uh, although some terms, the quadratic terms are simple and the terms to the nth are simple, there are cross terms. Whatever it is, you integrate over phi fast and you get this. Okay. Now here's the very interesting point. This delta L um, combines with this and what does it do? The only thing it can do is shift the values of the coupling constants. And the reason for that is that the Lagrangian already, let's put it this way. Okay, let me describe the Lagrangian. The Lagrange density here is going to include all terms that satisfy certain symmetries. That's a key idea. All terms that satisfy certain symmetries. So consequently, the, um, Delta L phi S also has to be, has to involve, can't involve anything other than terms that satisfy the certain symmetries. And so what you, you're going to have here for the, um, for this is it's going to look just like this, but it's going to have different coefficients. And so the result is that as you go from this to, as you go from this to integral lambda minus d lambda, d phi slow, e to the minus integral dx to the d, uh, l plus dl of phi slow, all of this of phi slow. So L of phi slow plus delta L of phi slow. This thing, this integration, looks just like the original integration, but the coefficients of the terms can be different. In fact, in general, many of them will be different. So is that the same thing as saying that this delta L is just going to be a in other field on the field? What, what, what's happening is that the lambdas are going to change, and there might be a change out here. All right. The, the rest of this, so let me, let me say what we're going to do next time on Wednesday. What I'm going to do Wednesday is I'm going to figure out how those coefficients change. And there's a cute way of figuring out how they change. That's, um, the basic idea here is that we, we, re, we, we just say that this is the same thing as an integral of an L prime integrated over a smaller, over less momenta, L lambda minus delta lambda, and then we just rescale the momenta, rescale distance, and when that happens, uh, we get formulas for how the lambdas, lambdas change. And um, the actual, I can write down the formula, but I, we don't have time to derive it because there are several steps. But it's going to be, remember there was this b less than 1? It's going to be b to the power n over 2, b minus 2, minus d times lambda n. So this is the, 
this is the way the coefficients change. So the values of the conserved quantities do not change, is it? Conserved, when, when, who's conserved? The conserved quantities for the corresponding symmetries in the Lagrangian. I haven't thought about the conserved quantities. I'm just talking about the coefficients in Lagrangian, how they change. Um, and, uh, well, I mean, if Lagrangian's invariant under some symmetry, then how could conserved quantities change? They won't change. Uh, my point is that if you have, if you're changing the coefficients, or do they change such that the value of the conserved quantity does not change? Mm. Let's see. Say that again. I said that again. So, given the Lagrangian, you have some conserved quantity, right, for corresponding to some symmetries. Right. I, I have rescaled the Lagrangian now, and I calculate them again. Do those quantities change, or do they not change by these relations? Well, the, the, let's put it this way. The nature of the things that are conserved is the same, because the symmetries are the same. The same yes. But um, the value of any conserved quantities depend upon initial conditions, right? Yes. So are they independent of the rescaling that you do? Um, I, I would guess that if, that if you're, in other words, suppose you're computing something physically. Right. If you're computing something physically and you do it here or you do yeah. it down here, it's going to change and it's going to change probably in some way that's somehow related to this. All right, why don't we...